Hi friends. For me, as Rachel Thomas, my life has always been a daring adventure and I'm going to take you through my journey today. For a minute, can you all close your eyes? Just for a second. Yes, come on, close your eyes. You imagine you are at minus 45. You are on top of the world and you are standing on point zero. Let's go one step further. You have skydived over the North Pole and you've landed there. Yes, you and your parachute have just landed there and you've got the Indian flag in your hand. What a proud moment it would have been for you. That's what I did in April 2002. Throughout my life, I've always believed, dream it, wish it, and achieve it. But everyone has dreams. Everyone has aspiration, but it can only come true with hard work, with sacrifice, and a lot of training. People have the Everest of their dreams. For me, the North Pole was my dream, but that journey started 38 years ago. Yes, 38 years ago. It was way back in 1979, when I was just 24 years old, and I was just, I was a mother of two kids. And I was at this army party when I got to know the first skydiving course was being opened up for civilians. I felt so excited. I always wanted to be like a bird in that sky, fly. And here my opportunity was coming up for me. So I decided to join the course. Next day morning, really the night before, I just could not even sleep. I was so, I was just waiting, when would day break and I'd be there for training. I got there and I was so amazed to see there were 45 people for the first course. Officers, men, and three women. The ground training was tough. The theory classes were even tougher. And after 15 days of training, a small little orange aircraft called the Beaver arrived. If you can see, that's the Beaver there in the picture. I was, I was on the second jump of the day. And I was all ready, wearing my parachute. And, but at the same time, these hands were sweating. When I think of that moment, I still can feel what I went through on my first jump. I was mumbling away prayers in my heart. And in the plane too, I just held on for dear life, my co-jumper's hand as if he's going to save me. Here I wanted to skydive. I've reached 5,000 feet, but it, it took a lot of me to get to that door. And now I had to jump out of that plane. You may be saying I'm crazy, but I wasn't. I always wanted to fly like a bird. So it took all of me to take that first leap. But I flew faster than the plane. I really flew faster than the plane and tried to get hold of that strut that you can see at the side. But because my hands were wet, I slipped and fell. I fell like a baby. <gasps> I quickly reached for my handle and pulled my parachute open. It was such a relief to see that parachute over my head. I quickly reached for the toggles, that they are the brake lines with which we fly our parachute, pulled them down, took a check where I was, and I headed off to the drop zone. Did a perfect para roll, and I was so happy. That was my first jump. I couldn't get over it. It didn't dawn on me that I had created history at that moment. For me, the jump was more exciting. But really, I had created history for the country. I was the first Indian woman to skydive. Mo much more than that, I broke barriers that day. I was a mother of two kids. I was a civilian. And who said girls can't skydive? So it changed the whole scene in India that now girls can do adventure sports. My second jump was quite similar, but on my third jump, I just would not get, I just was so focused how to get hold of that strut and I hung from it. I hung from it for dear life and I was flying like superwoman from that plane, yes I was. And my instructor had to lean out and push me down. When I got to the ground, 
I didn't realize that I could have killed everyone in the plane, including me, because I was not leaving that plane. My parachute would have opened. I was told, please do not come for any more jumps. Here, my mouth went dry. My heart stopped beating. What do I do? I just sat quiet in a corner, and some of my course mates came and said, go and ask for one more chance. So with a lot of strength, and I, was, I just went to my instructor and said, can you give me one more chance, please? So they agreed to give me one more chance. And I did my fourth jump. He said, they told me, you're not going to go out looking at the propeller. You're going to look at the tail and go, because there's nothing for you to hold there. Yes. So, but at the same time, I was told that when you do that jump, you will go into a dive because of the wind that is, the air that's coming from the propeller will push you down and you'll go into a dive. But if you make a good spread eagle position, which is our basic position, you will stable out. So I decided, okay, I'm willing to take a chance. I decided to go and jump. That was my fourth jump. I overcame fear. After that, there was no turning back for me. I could jump from any plane, from any height. We need to break our fear. <laughs> Everyone in life goes through it. Whether it's the guys or the girls, we all go through fear, but it's how we overcome it. I managed to do my 10, finish my 10 free fall jumps. I got my A license. I fulfilled my dream, wanting to fly like a bird. What next? Here, this whole thing of my, I want to keep jumping. How do I continue with my jumps? How is it going to happen in my life? Was the only thought that kept coming into me. Luckily, the following year, the Skydiving Federation opened up for, the, for that year. I managed to put in another 15 jumps. So now my score was 25 jumps. Since I had 25 jumps, they decided to allow me to be part of the demo team. What, it was in one such demo that I, my doors opened. The whole thing changed in my life. I got an opportunity to jump for the FAI. And jumping at the FAI, which is the apex body of all aviation sport, I was able to um, meet the delegates, and one delegate from Australia realized that I was a civilian. It was very difficult for me to continue in the country, so he invited me to Australia. When I reached there, I realized we were still at infancy in our country. They were so advanced, and he said, if you want to continue with your jumps, you have to go to America, and you have to buy your parachute there if you want to continue with the sport. I came to Witsend. Where's the money coming? I don't have that kind of money to go to America. What do I do? If we believe that we are the authors of our own life and we can carve our path, we can go ahead. And it was this thought that came to my mind that I wrote to Rajiv Gandhi. I just took plain piece of paper and wrote to him. And when I wrote to him, it got to him, and I got invited to meet him. He looked at my logbook, and he said, what is this? No pull, forgot to pull. For me, he was not the prime minister of the country. For me, he was a person who loved aviation. And I knew he would understand my passion. So I spoke to him, whatever you can think. Of. And that's the most beautiful picture I have with him smiling. It was just a letter written by hand, <laughs> but it worked. So he gave me the money. I got the PM scholarship. My next step, like I said, I headed to America. When I reached there, my instructor, who had seen my first jump, wrote the most motivational thing on my logbook. By the way, we have a logbook. Every jump we do, we write, and it's recorded and countersigned by our instructor. He wrote, that my body position was great, my stability was nice, but I got competitive spirit. I need, I can I be a very good competitor. That triggered something inside me. I focused, I will represent India. So I trained, I did 150 jumps in America, and that was my next goal. I am going to represent India in a competition. I had the nerve, but in the meanwhile, I want to tell you 
Doing these competitions are wonderful, but you need regular practice. You need regular training. And if you don't get the regular training, it's very difficult for you to continue the sport. So I tried to break barriers again in the country. I got special permission to jump with the Indian Air Force. I'm a civilian, and still women were not in, inducted into the forces. So I got that permission. I got permission to do 50 jumps with them. I jumped from the AM32 from 10,000 feet with the instructors. So what do I do? So I reached out to a friend in Turkey and asked, can I come and train with the Turkish team? So they said, OK, come along. So I went. I started training with the Turkish team in, in uh, Inunu, uh, where that main training base is. But unfortunately, on my 35th jump, I saw death. Yes, I did. Both my parachutes had opened out. My main parachute had got, was fully inflated, but my reserve got entangled a bit, and I had two parachutes that were washing, flying me in this manner. I couldn't solve my problem. There was no way that I could solve that problem. I said my prayers. I closed my eyes, thanked God for all he gave me and where he's brought me in life. I put both my kids into his hands, and I was ready to accept what was what was there for me. As a, when you do extreme sports, you know what you're going to face. You know what's going to happen. You are ready for it. So that was a moment in my life I still get gooseberries because I saw it in a dream the night previous. If I had landed where you're sitting, it's hard ground, I do not know what would have happened to me. I could have gone in a body bag, in a body bag back home. Or I could have been in a wheelchair my whole life. I don't know. But God was really kind with me. I landed where I'm standing. Some farmer soaked his field that night. It was soggy. I landed on my back, and a beetroot went up my vertebra. My second vertebra got compressed. But when I opened my eyes, I checked my legs. If they were working, my hands were working. I said, thank you, God. Everything is OK. Yes, but I needed to rest. And after one year, I started getting restless. My inner spirit said, oh, come on, come on, Rachel, get up, get up, move. So I, I looked for an opportunity to go and jump again, because in my country, I can't jump. I don't find the place to jump, so I went to Russia to jump. After two years, I did my first jump in Russia. When doctor, one doctor told me, don't even wear heels or drive a kinetic. But another doctor said, just do this exercise, show me. Forget that you ever had an accident. Just go and do it. And I did it. My fighting spirit always kept me going. It's there when I realized that this dream of winning a medal for India would never be fulfilled because I didn't have a proper coach. I didn't have proper training. So I decided, let's move my path. All of us at life come to that point when we have to be honest with ourselves. What, is, what Are we fooling ourselves? We need to know what we need to do, whether we need to move on or what we, you have to take a decision. And I realized I needed to move on. So I decided to be a judge for India. I trained in Austria. In life, we all go through different phases in our lives. It could be our jobs. It could be our marriages. It could be our financial problems. But if we let the situation rule us or, or overtake us, then the battle is lost. For me, during that time, my marriage broke. I had two kids. One was 10 and one was 9. It was my, my mother <clears throat> and my sister who were my rock. They stood with me. And yes, skydiving gave me a lot of comfort. It's, if I wanted to forget all my worries, it's when I went and skydived. I got to know that people jump on the North Pole. I said, I'm going to try that. So that, I decided, should be my pinnacle of my sport. And then for Moscow, I went to Siberia and reached the 89th latitude. If you look at some pictures, <coughs> it was here itself, it was minus 33. If you look at the next slide, you'll see 
how cold it got. It got, went to minus 55. It was impossible for us to even see that distance. We had to help an aircraft land. It was so difficult to even go to, to the restroom, which we take for granted over here. So it was very challenging because we had only one meal, and we had to be warm with that one meal and keep ourselves going. But I treasure it because I lived six days on the North Pole. I, have, I know how much the iceberg move. Our jump leader told us that this can crack and you can go through the Arctic Ocean. But I was happy there. My jump, of course, was great. I would like to simply say, how do we pull, take up our challenges and push our limits? And what is, for, uh, for the younger generation, what is there for them? It's always remember, you live this life only once. So grab every opportunity that you get. Push your limits. If you have to raise your bar, don't be comfortable where you're sitting or where you are and what position or what, what job you have. Think what next. Like me, I always thought what next. So everything for me happened the other way around. Like I told you, I was married when I was 17. I had to write my board exam, my senior Cambridge exam. That was the last year when I was seven months pregnant. But that didn't stop me. I did it. I completed my BA, BA later. I had two kids. My second kid was born to me when I was 20. I did skydiving when I did it one generation before time, but I did it. So the same thing applies to you. You have a dream and you should believe in your dream. You should always remember there are three simple rules in life. And that is, if, if, you, if you do not move from where you are, you'll be in the same place. If you do not ask, the answer will always be no. So you have to remember that you have to Take that plunge like I took that plunge. In skydiving, there are times when we take wrong decision in the sport, but you have to find an answer very fast. So that's part of life. We all take wrong decision. But if you know where you are heading for and what's your dream and be focused and say, I am an achiever, I will carve a niche for myself, you will do it. Everyone has a North Pole. Everyone has an Everest. I had my North Pole and I had my Everest, but I did it.